We will uh, do our best to, to make sure you get one. So um, while you're turning there, each week we have a, a COVID-19 update. And um, I'm going to try to be very general. Obviously, if you watch the news at all and, and are paying any attention or have an interest in COVID-19, So it is spreading, it is becoming more active um, in the schools, it's becoming more active in uh, any kind of public domains. Um, I was told that there was a church in Fayette County that had a large number of their
locked down in place. This is going. It may get worse. It has the potential to get worse. It may not get any worse. This may be the peak of what we see. We don't know yet. The numbers this week have been higher than at any point along the way. Yes, they're testing more. I understand that. Okay. But we don't know where. So the best advice is just be careful. Be careful. Be careful where you go. Be careful what you do. Okay. <clears throat> Many of you know that uh, because of my lovely wife, that yesterday was my birthday. Okay. And so I appreciate all of you that 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 uh, responded. I haven't got a chance to look at those uh, messages yet. Linda tells me that there were several messages sent, and and if you sent a message, I appreciate that. If you didn't send a message and you had a warm thought, I appreciate that. If you didn't do either and you had a nasty thought, I don't want to know that, okay? All right? So, but yesterday was my birthday. Well, you know, we had to make a decision. Um, Megan's birthday, my daughter's birthday was Friday. My birthday was yesterday, Saturday. We didn't have a birthday party. We didn't get together. We didn't get the family together. Thanksgiving is coming up. And I know my family, it's, it's the... It's the holiday that all of us get together for Thanksgiving. All of us. I think there's about 40 of us that normally get together for Thanksgiving. Unless something changes this year, we're not going to do that. Will we live? Yes. Will we survive? Yes. Will we eat turkey? Yes. Will we do all those things? Yes. But we're not going to get together as a family if this continues as it is. And frankly, I don't see it changing dramatically between now and then. Okay, so we are tentatively planning on not getting together for Thanksgiving, all right? And that's difficult, and that's hard, but those are the decisions that, that, that you have to make, okay? And fortunately, we live in a free country, and you can make those decisions, and I encourage that, but those are the types of things, the examples that I'm talking about that we need to look ahead and probably not have the get-togethers, the family get-togethers that... Um, that we, um, we normally have. This thing is spreading to the point. Um, I worked yesterday. My sister came to help me do some work on a project that I'm working on. And she called me last night to tell me, hey, I just got a call, okay, from somebody that had been in my shop that had tested positive. Now, fortunately, she didn't have any significant exposure to them. And fortunately, fortunately, um, they were, they had done the right things, okay, in terms of the protection. But I guess what I'm saying is, you're going to be exposed. I'm going to be exposed, you're going to be exposed, and you don't know who is going to expose you. You know, she said that the, the lady that called her, she had no idea that she was exposed, okay? I've gotten lots of calls this week from not just one hairdresser, but it seems to be active in the hairdressing world, okay? So there's four or five hairdressers in the area that have come down positive and have called their customers to say, hey, when you were in last week, I didn't realize it, but I had the COVID, okay? So it's out there, it's spreading. You are now mingling amongst it, okay? I can promise you, if you're getting out at all, you're being exposed to it. So just take precautions and be careful and minimize your exposures. That's the best advice I can give, okay? So sorry for the for a little bit of the length there, but um, I think they were having audio difficulties, right? Are we over that now? We're good? Okay. Well, if you had audio troubles, they, they say that's fixed, so welcome back. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. Philippians, the epistle of joy, okay? So listen, this is mandatory. When you study Philippians, you have to smile, okay? 
because the Apostle Paul is smiling at you when he's writing this epistle, uh, not only to the Philippians, but to us. And we're in a passage here of uh, verses three through eight. Paul is praying. Okay, Paul is Paul is verbally praying a prayer here to the Philippians, and it's it's a thankfulness. It's it's he's thankful. And as in the weeks ahead, as we go to Thanksgiving, which we are just give or take a month away, it's certainly time for us to be thankful. It's time for us to be thankful with everything that's going on around us and with what's happening. You say, how can I be thankful? Well, we need to be thankful in every situation and circumstance. So it's time for us to be thankful. So the Apostle Paul, in this passage, verses 3 through 8, gives five specific elements of his spirit-engendered joy as it relates to the Philippians. In other words, as it relates to the people around him, there are five elements to his joy that he outlines here. We got started on last week, and and we're going to pick up where we left off here in a second. But those five elements to remind everybody are this. In verse 3, Paul tells us the joy he gets from remembrance, from recollection, memories, We all have good memories, and we need to remember and smile when we have those memories. Number two, the joy of intercession, of interceding for others. That's in verse four. In verse five, he talks about the joy of participation. In verse six, he talks about the joy of anticipation. And in verses seven and eight, he talks about the joy of affection. So last week, we studied verse three, and I'm going to read verse three here. He says uh, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Okay? Every remembrance of you. Paul had fond memories of the Philippians. And we talked about what he went through in Philippi when he was there. We talked about, just in, uh, to review real quickly, Paul didn't want to go. or It wasn't his plan to go to, to Philippi, to Macedonia. His plan was to go to Bithynia. And God, the Holy Spirit, redirected him and said, no, you're not going to Bithynia. We need you to go to Macedonia. When he got to Macedonia, when he got to uh, Philippi, he did not find what he expected to find. Normally when he went into these areas, he would go to the synagogue and he would initiate contact with the Jewish uh, church there first and then uh, would evangelize all of those in the region. And Paul went to Philippi and there was, the synagogue was dead. There was nothing there. He ended up with um, a group of ladies uh, that were gathered together. And Lydia uh, was the first convent, or convert rather, uh, to Christianity in, that, in Europe. And you could say that she would be the matriarch of the Christian church in Europe. Okay? So it didn't go as Paul had planned. All right. Paul ended up in jail. And we ended up in jail, ended up having a major earthquake, but ended up being able to evangelize not only everybody in the jail, but the jailer and his entire household. And so there's no question that Paul had some interesting stories about his time in Philippi, okay, in Macedonia. And they were good stories, all right? And even though... Paul at the time uh, probably couldn't understand why God sent him to Philippi and there was no one there for him to meet with initially and he ends up in jail he get, you know, and, and had ended up being beaten and put in jail and I guess if I were Paul and, that, and at that moment I would have said what in the world were you thinking? Why did you send me here? Okay, Not knowing that the Philippian church would end up being the cornerstone of the evangelism of Europe. And the, and the biggest blessing to him of all the churches, that ended up being the biggest blessing to him of all the churches. They supported him more than anybody else. And they weren't rich like the Corinthians. Remember the Corinthians? They were loaded. Okay? But the Philippians, those were the ones that stood beside him every day from that day forward. You see, God knew what he was doing. The Apostle Paul had one plan God had a better plan. And that's the way it is with us all the time. 
You know, we have a plan. I have a plan. I think I've got it figured out. I'm pretty smart, by the way. Okay? And I've got it figured out. I know what I'm doing. Trust me. I'm a doctor. Okay? Um, but the truth of the matter is his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He has a plan. The difference between me and the Apostle Paul is the Apostle Paul is obedient to his plan. The Apostle Paul didn't question his plan. The Apostle Paul didn't argue with him about his plan. Okay? And I tend to do all those things. So, number one, Paul had good memories of the Philippian church and good memories of his time in Philippi. Let's go to verse 4. Okay? Verse 4, Paul says... Always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. Okay. So in verse 3, Paul says, I find joy in my memories of you. In verse 4, the Apostle Paul says, I find joy every time I pray. I make intercession for you. Okay. The joy of intercession. Some of you already realize this, you prayer warriors out there, and I know that you're out there. And the reason I know that is I have some of you come into the office to see me. And before we're finished with the visit, you will make it a point to say, Doc, I pray for you. And some of you have told me you pray for me every day. Well, I'll tell you, that is humbling. That is humbling. And when somebody tells me that, I am filled with a bubbly charge in my battery that blesses me the rest of the day. Okay? I am blessed. The most important thing that anybody could ever tell me, or that any, the, the best compliment that anybody could ever give to me would just say, you're important enough that I pray for you. You're important enough to me that I pray for you on a regular basis. Well, I can tell you, I need those prayers. I need those prayers. And when I'm made aware that that's happening, I get a rise, okay? I get a rise. It, gives, it strengthens me, okay? So the Apostle Paul says, listen, I experience joy when I pray for you, when we pray or intercede before God on behalf of others, it will bring joy to you and to me. When we put, because it reflects our heart, when we put the needs of others above our own, we will receive a blessing in return. I heard a Christian commentator many years ago say that he had made a decision many years before that time that he was never he was never going to pray for his own needs he was going to pray he was going to acknowledge that God would supply all of his needs according to his riches and glory and he said I acknowledge that to the Lord and said I accept that I'm not going to question it from this point forward from this point forward I'm only going to pray for others I'm not going to pray for my own needs father I accept your promise that you're going to supply my needs. And so that's a done deal. And I'm not going to go over there. And he said he started just praying for others. And that's all he did was pray for others. And he said days went by, weeks went by, months went by. And now years have went by. And he said that he's never been more blessed. Okay. Faithful intercessors are more preoccupied with the needs and the welfare of others than they are their own. An infallible test of godly joy is the degree to which a believer prays more earnestly for the benefit of others than for themselves. You show me a Christian believer that always puts the needs of others above their own. And when they bow before the throne of God, they lift others before themselves. And I will tell you that that is a mature man or woman of God. Okay? They are spiritually mature. Intercessory prayer, though, when we do that, we have to understand that when we 
put the needs of others above our own and when we intercede for others before ourselves and we pray for whatever it may be, we pray for whatever our prayer is for that individual. And it may be just as simply as, Lord, wrap your hand around them and your will be done. That's fine. But the one thing you have to understand, whenever you're dealing with other people, okay, whether it's your children, whether it's your brother or your sister or your parents or your best friend or whoever it may be, whenever you're dealing with others, we have to understand something. God gives each one of us free will to do what we want to do. So I may think I know what's best for you, and maybe it is what's best for you. And God knows what's best for you, that's for sure. But the one thing God will not do is he will not violate free will. He will not. He gives us a choice each and every day. And he gives us a choice to do what we want to do. Okay? All right? And so I want to warn all of you and warn myself. When we latch on to someone who has a need and we intercede for them faithfully in prayer. And we become emotionally involved in their situation or circumstance. There could be disappointment. Disappointment. Look at Philippians and just go to chapter 3, verses 17 through 19 as an example of that. Philippians chapter 3, 17 through 19 says this. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. Okay? Paul said, be aware. There are those among us that we are going to be interceding for that are not going to respond. They're not going to respond the way that, that we pray that they respond. And Paul said that he was weeping on their behalf. Okay? Whenever you become involved in a family, whether it's your own family or your church family or your community family, you're going to have individuals that are going to tug at your heartstrings. It's, there's going to be disappointing. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4 says this. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. The Corinthians broke Paul's heart. We saw times where the Galatians broke Paul's heart. Okay? So, when you put the needs of others above your own, there's going to, at times there's going to be some disappointment. Okay? Paul did not allow, though, situations or circumstances to rob him of his joy. It's like we've talked before. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You have to decide right this minute, moving forward, that no one is going to steal your joy. Okay? You can pray for old Joe or for, old, for, for Aunt Susie all you want to. Okay? And do that. And know that there's nothing more powerful than prayer. But unfortunately, things don't always work out as we would pray for them to. We cannot allow situations and circumstances in our lives to steal our joy. We can't allow situations and circumstances in others' lives to steal your joy. For those out there that have children, there's nothing that can break your heart more than something to happen to one of your kids. Or one of your kids to make a bad decision or have a bad outcome. You know, you can pick on me all you want to. Don't pick on my kids. And even worse, don't pick on my grandbabies. Okay? All right? But we have to understand that. And we have to, we have to rise above that. Okay? We cannot let situations or circumstances steal our joy. Look at Philippians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Paul tells us. Okay? Philippians chapter 4, verse 3 says this. 
And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Again, he's putting the others above himself. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Apostle Paul didn't say rejoice in the Lord when the sun's shining. Rejoice in the Lord when your corn makes 250 bushels an acre. Rejoice in the Lord when the stock market's above 28,000. He didn't say that. He said rejoice in the Lord always. Always. And again, I say rejoice. And in this passage, in verses 3 and 4 we just read, he connected that with fellow believers. That doesn't mean we're not going to face hardship. That doesn't mean we're not going to face difficulties. That doesn't mean we're not going to get our heart broke. That doesn't mean the bad things aren't going to happen. In fact, just the opposite. Bad things are going to happen. And that's why it's imperative that we know. Rejoice in the Lord always. Okay. This COVID virus is a big deal and I'm not happy about it. And I'm, I frankly have had enough of it. But that doesn't make any difference. It, it's, it's there. It's, it's, it's going. We're, we're dealing with it. But I will not let it steal my joy. If it steals my joy, I'm done. Okay? The joy of the Lord is our strength. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Believers who possess the God-given joy do not focus on themselves. Even in the midst of pain and difficult circumstances, their focus is always on those around them. The, the Apostle Paul, the reason he was able to be on death's row in that Roman prison and be full of joy, the best day ever, is the focus wasn't on his circumstances. His, the focus was on all of those around him. Okay, He was more concerned about the needs of others and was earnestly interceding for them. He was joyfully praying for God's blessings for others. Philippians chapter 2 verse 4 gives us another example. It says, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Now that verse tells us it's okay to look out for your own interest. And it is. I'm not saying that you don't. I pray every day. I pray every morning. Every morning. I pray for the patience and I pray that God would give me wisdom to take care of them, okay? But a true man and woman of God that truly experiences the joy of the Spirit intercedes for those around them. They're sensitive to the pain that people have around them. They're sensitive to the needs of others. And they're thankful for the opportunity to serve in that area. Sadly, only a minority of Christians realize the fullness of God's joy. I have not experienced the fullness of His joy. I've gotten a little taste of it and I like it. Okay? But I know that there's room for me to grow. There's room for me in this area. I need to intercede even more for the needs of those around me. Okay? And so... The lack of joy can reveal itself in three ways in a believer's life, okay? Just something for us to think about. Number one, the lack of joy can cause negative thoughts and talk about others. You know, the old saying, misery likes company, right? If I'm miserable, I want you to be miserable. I want everybody to be miserable. I may not admit to that. But the truth of the matter is, if we have negative thoughts about others and we find ourselves talking badly about others, chances are we're not where we need to be. Number two, selfishness, self-centeredness, and pride always is a manifestation of the lack of God's joy. Again, putting our needs above others. Pride is... Generally, the process of trying to make myself look better at your expense. Thoughts of superiority, okay? And then prayerlessness. 
I would make the argument right now that if you and I are not spending time every day in earnest and sincere prayer, we are not going to experience the joy that he has for us. Okay? So in verse 4, in Philippians chapter 1, we see Paul says, Always in every prayer of mine, making request for you with all joy. Wow. Okay. Verse 5, we see the third element of Paul's joy. He says, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. The joy of participation. That word koinonia, which is K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A, is a fellowship of communion. Okay, And we're not talking about, even though later today we're going to experience communion. Okay, at the Lord's table. We're talking beyond that. The joy of participation. Sharing something in common. Sharing something in common. When you find somebody that has something in common with you, there's an immediate connection. Okay? You can take a farmer from Nebraska, a farmer from Iowa, a farmer from Illinois, a farmer from Indiana, a farmer from Ohio, and you put them in a room, and I guarantee you, you're going to have five instant friends. Immediately. Why? Because they're all farmers. Instantly. I, I promise you, they could talk for hours. How's the crops? How much rain have you got? Okay? What's it look like? You know, instantly five buddies because they have something in common. They're all farmers. All right. There is joy in sharing something in common. Okay. And it can be anything. It can be, you know, it can be vocation. It can be possessions. It can be, you name it. Okay. In the early church, we saw where the church shared everything. We can look in Romans here real quickly. Go to Romans chapter 12. And they experienced joy. I would venture to say that the church has never experienced more joy than it experienced in the early days when they were all together and had so many things in common and participated in fellowship. Look at Romans chapter uh, 12, verse 13. I found it here. Distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. They distributed to each other's needs. They took, they took care of each other. Romans 15, 26. Romans 15, 26 says, For it pleased those from Macedonia, that's Philippi, and Achaia to to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. That's participation. 1 Timothy 6, 18. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 18 says, Let him do good that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Hebrews 13, 16. Hebrews 13, 16. Says this, But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. If you and I as Christian believers are sitting on the sidelines, and I know that we're at level red. Okay, we just talked about that. And I just said a minute ago, we're not to party together. Okay, I understand that. All right, this is temporary. All right, this will eventually end. Okay, this will eventually stop. But having said that, and there are other ways to fellowship, by the way. We're doing it right now. We're fellowshipping right now on Facebook. Okay? So, but my point is, as Christians, this is a team sport. This isn't an individual sport. And sometimes it's tempting to sit on the sidelines and let others get out on the field. Okay? You're robbing yourself when you do that. 
you're robbing yourself. If we are to experience the fullness of his joy, we are to fellowship with one another. We are to participate with one another. Okay? In the broadest sense, participation is in the spreading of the gospel. You know, we are all given the same marching orders. Okay? Jesus gave us all instructions before he ascended to be with the Father. We have a common mission. We have a common goal. Okay? All believers are spiritually one. Okay? Let's look at Matthew 28, 19 through 20, just to review that. Okay? You all know that's the Great Commission. Matthew 28. Okay? Here we go. Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says this. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. He's with us. We're to go out and share the gospel, the good news. We've talked about that before. We talk about that again. It's, it can be in what you say and what you do. It can be in a smile. It can be in so many ways to be the salt and light that he's called us to be. But you cannot do that adequately by sitting on the sidelines. Okay? Paul, remember, we're talking about his joy. And he says, my joy comes from my memories. My joy comes from my intercession. I pray for you each day, and that brings me joy. That's something we can do. I don't care how feeble you may be or I may be. We can always pray for somebody. Number three, Paul says, I experience joy in fellowshipping with you, in participating with you. Okay? There are seven aspects of Christian fellowship. Okay? Christian participation. We can fellowship with each other seven different ways. And I know these lists sometimes get cumbersome. I'm, I'm going to go through this quickly. Okay? But the first thing that binds us together in participating is what I said a minute ago. We are all called to the same mission. And we have all experienced the same grace. Grace is the God-given thread that binds us all together. It's His grace that connects to me and you. Remember I said a minute ago that you take five farmers from five parts of the United States and you put them together. And they are instantly connected. They have never known each other. But they have so much in common. Well, the one thing, you know, we should never ever meet a Christian brother or sister and be a stranger. We should instantly be connected. Why? Because we have both received God's grace. Okay? And His grace is sufficient. It's God's given thread that binds us all together. Okay? And we know in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, we've read this so many times, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Okay? We've all receive the same gift. That grace binds us together. The second thing that binds us together is our faith. And we know that grace comes through faith. Okay? Grace comes through faith. It told us that in Ephesians chapter 8 verse 2 or chapter 2 verse 8. It says, "For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the work of God." Faith. Grace comes by our faith. Prayer and thanksgiving. Nothing binds us more closely together than prayer and thanksgiving. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20. Ephesians 5, verse 20 tells us that giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Fellowship of love. Fellowship of love. All right? That binds us together. That makes us strong. 
1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you read that chapter, verses 4 through 13, that's the, the love chapter, so to speak. Okay? 13, 4 through 13 says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they fail. There are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. No, now I know in part But then I shall know just as I am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. When we fellowship, we fellowship in love. When we participate, we contribute to the needs of others. Okay? Jane Ellen is waving at me, so I'm going to wrap this up. We contribute to the needs of others in participation. When we participate as Christian believers, we are separate from the world. Okay? We are called out to be separate from the world. And we have to understand, when we participate with one another, it is at a spiritual level. This is a spiritual participation. Okay, We are connected spiritually, which supersedes and transcends the situations or circumstances. As I said a minute ago, this COVID-19 is a horrible situation. But the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we are rising above that, okay? I don't know what's going to happen. And I don't want this to be misinterpreted. But frankly, it does not matter what happens. God is in control. And I know the ultimate, the ultimate end to all of this. And it's good. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's very good. Okay? And we have a choice right now. We can either walk in the spirit or we can walk in the flesh. When we dive into concerns about whatever it may be, whether it's COVID-19, whether it's the upcoming election, whether it's uh, the financial situation that we're in, whether it, it, whatever it may be, whatever it may be, when we take our focus off him and put our focus on the world in situations and circumstances, it steals our joy. And the Apostle Paul is trying to tell us here, when we take our focus off of those around us, our Christian brothers and sisters, and when we fail to remember each other, when we fail to intercede on behalf of each other, when we fail to participate with each other and share with each other, we lose our joy. He was able to maintain his joy Because he was able to do those things. Okay? All right? The last two things, which we haven't got to today, but we will get to the next time, is the joy of anticipation. We've got a lot to look forward to as individuals and as brothers and sisters. And the joy of affection. Okay? What that means. So we will pick up next time. I will be gone next week. Okay? But then the week after that, I'll be back and we'll pick up in the passage of the five elements of joy. Remembrance, intercession, participation, anticipation, and affection. Okay, Study Philippians. You'll be better for it. Allow the Lord to speak to you. Reach out to others okay? and make a difference. All right. Any prayer requests, guys? Up on the screen. Okay. Diane Ewing Jameson, prayer needed. Spasms in the back. Prayer needed for Susie. Okay, so remember Diane and Susie. Jan Hartzell, uh, prayers for John McMillan. That's Linda's father. And he is experiencing health difficulties, but he's overcoming them. And, uh, but it's a, it's a daily struggle. Shelly uh, Feisinger, 
prayers for Jim. He's having flashbacks and migraines. So we remember Jim, Fi Singer. I'll add to that. We'll pray for uh, my dad as well, who's suffering from health issues. But again, he's recovering. He's, he's making progress, and we're certainly thankful for that. So let's pray. Let's intercede for everybody. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for your joy, for joy unspeakable and full of glory, for joy that passes understanding, for joy that gives us strength. We thank you for that. And Father, we are determined to not allow anyone or anything to steal our joy. We know, Father, we battle not against flesh and blood, but we battle a spiritual battle. Pray that you would help us to recognize that and pray that you would help us to walk in your spirit. Help us to bring forth the fruit of your spirit, which includes your joy. Father, we realize that your joy is not dependent upon our circumstances. That your joy is above and beyond anything we could ask. And we thank you for it. Father, part of that joy is to intercede for others. And we come unto you on behalf of those that have been listed here as prayer requests. We know that you're aware of their situation, of their circumstances, and we pray that your will would be done. We pray first and foremost for a spiritual renewal, for a spiritual blessing. In addition, we pray for a physical healing. Pray that your hand would be upon them and that you would bless them that they would feel your peace and feel your presence, that their bodies would heal and that they would be restored in fullness to serve. Father, we know the best way to serve you is to serve others. We pray that you would help us. Help us to understand what the Apostle Paul has taught here today. Help us to remember all of the good things that you've done for us, for that will bring us joy. Help us to intercede for others as we are doing now, as we know that will bring us joy. Show us opportunities that we can participate in fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, for we know that will bring joy. Help us to anticipate the future and to recognize that you're in control. All things work together for the good. I'm excited about the future. I'm excited about what you have for me, what you have for this church, what you have for our, our community. I'm excited about the days ahead with you, and I thank you for the anticipation that we have together. And Father, I thank you for the affection of others, for those that have shown your love towards me, and pray that you would help me to show your love back to them. Father, I thank you for all that you've done. Pray that you would be exalted above all, that you would be lifted up, that you would be glorified, that you would be praised, for you are worthy. It's in your name. It's in Jesus' name. We pray these things. Amen. Thank you. God bless. Have a great week. And uh, just be full of his joy that it will just overflow you and spill into the lives of others. Thank you.